Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the August 30th joint meeting of the Planning Board and Conservation Commission. Uh, the Conservation Commission has been working on the portion of the zoning ordinance dealing with wetlands, and I understand Kate has a presentation to explain what the Conservation Commission has been doing. If you can go through those, Kate, maybe pause at each red line and we can have comment, discussion, and advance through it as you go through the document. All right. Thank you. And we have a, Allison wanted to give just a little background. Yeah, I just wanted to desire. just make sure everyone speaks into the microphones because if you don't, no one from home can hear us. Okay. Um, my name is Allison Tanner. I've been on the Conservation Commission for 33 years. Um, so I'm the longest standing member. In fact, I think I'm long, here longer than Peter and a lot of other people. But at any rate, um, we have a sense of frustration because the wetlands protection is really what we're centered about. And yet we see lots of changes happening in the community that we have no um, jurisdiction over. And um, so what we try to do in our efforts is also pay attention to what's happening with the climate and see if there were some adjustments that we could make that would enable us to have maybe less flexibility on the part of some of the projects that come in front of us. And so uh, that's the place that we started at, and we just made a few changes in that regard. Thank you. I don't know, was there, I know we have everybody's name tags, but is there an opportunity? Who are we gonna kind of do a, I don't know, just say a little something, or is that? Introduce yeah. ourselves quickly. If you'd like to, sure. Okay. Go for it. Sure. <laughs> um, well, it was suggested just to say something, just to give a little background. And um, Barbara McMillan, I'm the uh, co chair or the, the vice chair, sorry, of the Conservation Commission and have been on for a little bit less than Allison, probably five or six years less, maybe. <laughs> Um, and uh, just a, a little background, I used to work at the Department of Environmental Services on water quality education programs and grants for the 319 EPA grants and stormwater management. Um, and uh, I think that's about all I need to say, but just. Great. Uh, Samantha Collins, uh, Chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, my background is um, I have a master's in coastal geomorphology, which is an earth sciences department, um, specifically related to salt marshes and salt marsh restoration. And I was an environmental consultant uh, before I started my family a couple years ago. I'm Rick Chalman, I'm chair of the planning board and I'm a licensed engineer and land surveyor and land planner. We skipped Peter, but. Did you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Peter Brintz, the Director of Planning and Sustainability. I've been here 22 years and a background in environmental planning and, and uh, coastal zone management as well. I'm Peter Stith, I'm the Planning Manager. I've been here six and a half years and staff to the Planning Board. And actually my major in college was environmental studies, so <laughs> some connection. Uh, I'm Trevor McCord, I'm the Deputy City Attorney. Um, my degree was in law. <laughs> and I've been here for, for four years. My name is Andrew Simonis. I don't have the title deputy anything. Uh, I stopped for a cup of coffee on the Conservation Commission before joining the Planning Board a couple of years ago. Uh, I have a degree in uh, real estate development and urban design. And I work in real estate today and uh, generally have a uh, real estate lens on some of these proposals and considerations. So that may differ from the other side of the table. Uh, Beth Moreau, current city councilor and city council rep on planning board, previous planning board member, and like Trevor, I have a law degree. <laughs> I do uh, residential title services for a living, so I do deal with the resident uh, real estate side of things. Peter Harris, I'm planning board, resident of Portsmouth for 32 years. Um, been on the planning board for almost three years now, in my first term, and. Um, met with the Con Conservation Commission at, uh, when we went to Belle Isle for that tour. And I've had an interest and concern about wetlands around the greater Portsmouth area and development related. Yeah, hi. I, I share that sentiment. I'm so glad that we're taking a look at this. Thanks for doing the work. Um, I'm Jane Begala. I have a, a 
public health degree and an MBA. Um, I'm retired. I'm just a community member who cares tremendously about the community in which I grew up. Um, but my undergraduate degree was zoology with a minor in ecology. So I have a background that understands the science behind some of this stuff. Um, I attended the, I can't remember the name of the conference, but there was a recent conference on, um, it was actually saving history against Keeping rising, history above water. whatever, <laughs> rising tides. Um, I have also been on site visits with Conservation Com Commission because this is like my second round of being on the planning board. And I actually believe that we should be on more site visits, both the planning board and, and you all, because it, it's always a learning experience. It always makes the review more in depth. So I'm very pro site visits. Thank you very much though for doing this work. Yeah, hi, my name is Jim Hewitt. I'm a civil engineer and I've been on the planning board for a year and a half. Uh, hi, my name is Greg Mahana. I've been in Portsmouth for 25 years, uh, business management background, also a general contractor and a landlord, and I've been on the planning board. I've joined with Jim. I'm Bill Bowen. I'm the opposite of Allison. I've been on the, uh, as an alternate on the planning board for two days. <laughs> uh, uh, general business uh, background and uh, just a citizen of the city. Um, I'm Kato May. I'm an associate environmental planner with the planning department. Been here for about a little over a year now, so glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm Abby Gindell. I've been on the planning, I um, mean, no, sorry, <laughs> on the Conservation Commission <laughs> um, for about a year and a half. Um, my family's lived in Portsmouth for 30 years. I've lived in Portsmouth for coming on nine. And um, from early reports, I've been an environmentalist since I was a tiny little girl. So, um, and I've taken, um, I majored in English way back when but uh, had a lot of zoology classes and since then have taken a lot of science and stuff like that. And I have been living um, an environmentally conscious life um, with like no long landscapes and things like that for, um, for a long time since. Anyway. I'm Lynn Vaccaro. I've been on the commission for about a year. It's, it's super interesting to hear these introductions. So thank you for taking time to do that. Um, I also, you know, grew up in Portsmouth like Jane. My kids go to the same school that I went to, elementary school. Um, I have a background in natural resources. I currently work for New Hampshire Fish and Game, and part of my role is working with communities around Great Bay. So I've got a little bit of visibility to how some of the other communities handle things like wetland rules, which is, which is helpful. I'm Brian Gibb. Some of you will know me actually probably from the Portsmouth page because I interact with the, a lot of people there. Uh, I'm a uh, retired CEO. I started a group of healthcare security companies and I've retired from that. Uh, I've got an engineering background, an MBA. What's my interest or relevance here? I, I grew up on a large farm and plain in timbers and so I have a great interest in conservation both in the city and the state and I own um, two 300 acre farms, uh, one in the Midwest and one in Texas. So I do have um, kind of the feet on the ground background with some of this. Thank you very much. So Kate. Let me just share my screen. So for a presentation, it's really just sort of the line by line with some clarity on what each red line change is within the ordinance that we went through. And if anyone needs any copies, I have four hard copies left. If anyone needs paper copies. Just, you might want to pull your mic a little oh. closer. Just. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. So just for a quick overview of the sort of subjects that we're going over. So we know that Article 10 is all about environmental protection, um, specifically wetland protection. So we're trying to, as Allison was saying, instill more language around climate impacts and resiliency. We're a, a bigger change that we're going for, which doesn't really have a, a physical change but more a language change is changing the vegetated buffer area to also saying no cut which is what it is but it's just making it more obvious um, we're going to be requiring hopefully a planting and landscaping plan with all applications which is something that we ask for a lot right now as a stipulation 
um, more language in there around wildlife corridor protections, <coughs> around light pollutions and noise pollutions as well. Uh, we're going to look at what we already do for a stipulation a lot is looking for mitigations through plantings, if there's um, going to be any removal of vegetation in the buffer or any disturbance. And also NOFA standards, which is something that we have been putting in as stipulations for a lot of applications in the last year or two. Do you understand what NOFA? We, we can jump into that too. <laughs> um, and you might have to say the, the, ac the long acronym for it too, because I might forget what it stands for. <laughs> I always get it wrong. But um, so we'll be looking at also the buffer. And so one of the biggest changes that we're proposing here today is extending the buffer for further protection. Um, and also looking a little bit into snow storage requirements in the wetland buffer. And so the first um, big red line change in here is section 10.1011 number nine. And it's on the first page, so adding sort of that purpose statement of um, to assist in protecting and improving the future of Portsmouth's resiliency with regard to climate change impacts and maintaining carbon neutrality. Um, I don't know if we want to just stop and discuss at every any comments? Any input? Yes, Greg. I don't think it's the role of the planning board or the zoning to kind of head towards something as non-physical as carbon neutrality. I don't think it belongs in the zoning or in this ordinance. It's not very well defined either. Excuse me, what was that second? It's also not very well defined. Anybody want to pick up on that? Um, Andrew had his hand up, but do you you following up with Greg? I have a suggestion. Okay. <laughs> Instead of saying maintaining carbon neutrality, how about supporting Portsmouth um, eco municipality? That's in our master plan, right? It's actually one of our policies. Yeah. That was going to be along the lines of my comment as well, just in regard to the term maintaining carbon neutrality like we're not carbon neutral right now so I guess striving for carbon neutrality would be more accurate <clears throat> at least in this current moment maybe not future tense so improving the future reports of resiliency and striving toward becoming more eco friendly community something like that well, while adhering to the eco municipality standard Echo municipality. I just think it says sort of the same thing, but doesn't, you know. Right. It's not a lightning run. Correct. <laughs> this isn't just a planning board discussion, though. You guys worked on this, so. So I think, you know, one of the reasons we put this in here is this is just in our, our purpose. This is just a very broad overview of the mm -hmm. things we would like to um, impact more with regards to our community and kind of putting it in the purpose is sort of a first step knowing we can't really get into the nitty-gritty with any of this further into our regulations probably at this time but it gives us kind of a jumping off point that this is something that we want to think about going forward um i don't know if Allison, yeah, we, you have anything we want to, to try about? to maintain carbon neutrality and the reason that really comes up is because we get a lot of applications where they want to cut down a forest and put in a parking lot and you know that that's literally true and we were looking for something there is no state enabling legislation at the moment for us to stipulate that people put solar carports or something to sort of try to balance out what they're doing so that was why we put it there. And if you feel that the wording supporting Portsmouth is an eco municipality is better and it's not less light, lightning rod, that's fine. But I just wanted to let you know our purpose when we wrote that. What about achieving instead of maintaining? Would that be something that you guys, because you said we don't have carbon neutrality? I think if you, uh, I've written a lot of regulations and I've got some comments later on, but uh, I think if you typically, made the edit that Council Moreau was suggesting, it's inclusive enough to include what you're trying to do. And then as you get into the body of the ordinance, we should talk about tree cutting and you know trade-offs for that. That's where you really want to hit that hard if it's a topic that is going to survive and make it to a final ordinance stage. That's my opinion. Well, I'm good with the, the wording. 
Yeah. Is somebody keeping notes of what we're talking? Yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was hoping somebody else is because I'm not. I'd just um, like to suggest that if we're going to change that wording, that there's a reference there to exactly where that policy can be found. Well, we have. Um, under wetlands protection, we have for definitions, please refer to Article 15. Mm -hmm. So we could put it into Article mm -hmm. 15. Everybody good with that? Next one. By the way, as we go along, if somebody has something between the red lines, raise your hand. And so this next one is sort of what you'll see next as the red line. It's the third page, but it's also going to be throughout the document, um, is the addition of the phrase no cut to wherever you see the word vegetated buffer strip. And that's really just clarifying the fact that um, no vegetation removal is allowed in the vegetated buffer strip. That's something that was already sort of um, a rule, but maybe not as obvious with just the word vegetated buffer strip. And just add, add to that that <clears throat> really the vegetated buffer strip is an area that you're not allowed to cut within. So if we're going to make that change, it was really just to highlight the fact that it, that's what it means. But we'd have to change the definition as well to add no cut to the definition. Just so and we're aware. in this instance, no cut means all vegetation, no matter brush, anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is further on in the in the ordinance there is literate, um, language that expresses the fact that if you have invasive species, that that's different that you could potentially go in and remove invasive species. Yes, Jane. Before we move on, just because you said if we have anything in between, um, on page two, um, I it's it's a question that I have, you know, it's the first bullet under jurisdictional areas. Um, so if the inland wetland or vernal pool is less than 10,000 square feet, it would not be included in these provisions. I, I wondered what the th The thought. vernal pool can be less than 10,000 square feet, but we're, right. we, yeah. we're talking about an inland wetland 10,000 feet or greater. So that's where the. So it can't be, it can't be smaller than that. And, and, and what's the rationale? We actually cut it down. I can't remember what it was. It was before. it was half an acre, and the last time they went through the ordinance, they dropped it down to a, basically a quarter acre, um, and that's the rationale. That the thought is that there is a state regulation that you can't fill wetlands, and there's no minimum size on that. So once you get under 10,000 square feet, it kind of falls into the state to watch out for wetlands, wetlands that are filled. And I think some of the thinking is a buffer on a wetland smaller than 10,000 square feet would be a pretty massive buffer compared to the size of the wetland itself. Um, so it, it becomes complicated to protect it at that point. I think that was the thinking. And yep. And a vernal pool is just a different beast, which we don't include here. But it's a good question because during our discussions when we were going over these regulations, there was some discussion about having Portsmouth have a regulation regarding filling wetlands in addition to the state's wetland regulation. So, and that would be different than what you see here. So. Everybody good moving on? Move on to the next. So the next one will be in section 10.17.20 and it's number 10. It's the addition of one of the application requirements. So we are asking that applicants provide a planting plan which will detail the species and the proposed locations of plants that are going to be installed. And so I think this really came about with a lot of um, conditions and stipulations in the last few years asking for these plans. And also staff has been um, asking ahead of time that applicants come in with these ready to go <coughs> so that people has a better idea of what's going in and what's going to help to mitigate their application for disturbance. Yes, and procedural question. When you have that um, and you have a new planting plan that is substantive enough to be incorporated right into like a newer development, obviously maybe of the, the bigger size, would it be helpful to have a drainage plan for that as well? Or are those typically combined or included? 
we, we yeah. usually discuss that. I mean, that is part of the plan that comes in front of us that we have to decide, you know, how are they, what are, how are they handling the drainage on this property? And a lot of times um, there is no drainage handling at present. And so the person that's developing the property is going to add drainage to improve the buffer, the wetland, hmm. whatever. So that is part of what needs to come in front of us. Um, regard the, regarding the detailed planting plan, one of the other things that um, there's been a lot of uh, literature put out regarding lawns and the fact that they're really valueless and they don't support a biodiversity of species. And so we would like people to get out of the habit of just putting back lawn when they do things. So we would like to see a planting plan. <clears throat> how big were you thinking, how large an area, let's say a homeowner wants to do something that encroaches in the buffer, as we get applications like that all the time, as you well know. Um, the entire property, the area, is there a limit to the area, the planting plan? We're very wishy-washy on that. I mean, we we try to look at each plan individually and suggest, you know, blueberry bushes, one every five feet or something like that, you know, but it, it really depends on the plan that we're looking at. We're trying to get them to put in native species that will benefit wildlife. We're trying to get them to put in maybe a wildflower meadow instead of planting a lawn. We don't specify, but we understand that people like lawns and that they mm -hmm. want them. We just would like them not to be as extensive as they are on some of these properties. <clears throat> and so that's, and again, we don't have any, anything concrete that we can stand on. Peter. I was just going to say, from a mechanic standpoint, I think one of the thoughts is also that it often comes up as their the conservation Christians reviewing an application that there's an impact because of the project they're doing, but there's they haven't really thought about how, that that the commission might want them to offset that impact. So this kind of gets them thinking about it when they put the application in. What does this mean? A planting plan? Why am I doing that? And so a lot of times the reason they want a planting plan is to offset the impact from the development. So it's really a, a placeholder at the beginning. They might they might get more detail by asking staff, or when they come to the meeting, they'll at least be aware the commission's looking for that and know about it. But um, we don't have any, I don't think any hard and fast came out of our discussion on what it should be. So is it, would it be fair to say you're thinking of the areas that are proposed to be impacted and possibly areas that have previously been impacted? Would that be inclusive enough to? Correct. In terms of area or location of planting? Well, in the area that would then be subject to a planting plan. Because I think typically we also try to get the plantings to be you know as close to the wetland as possible even if that's not where we would hope you know the more impervious surface is going or the alteration of terrain is going but that's where they we kind of get the best bang for our buck in planting them there if possible yeah plants are much better at um, absorbing things that we don't want to go into the wetland than lawn or uh, if they if they put it on the other side of their house versus closer to the wetland so that's why we try to concentrate in the buffer closer to the wetland putting some plants in there and we'll have situations where people come to us um, with applications and maybe have a consultant working with them and they'll say you know we're gonna offset some of our impacts by doing planting in the buffer and then they'll also mention that they're going to do plantings in other parts of the property not in the buffer and so you know we haven't discussed this to figure out in detail what we want but for somebody saying we're going to offset our impacts we want to know what they're planning there too so it's not just the buffer i'm just trying to think in terms of preparing an application to for submission how does the and how does staff find guidance to tell the applicant what to do um, that's that's what I'm struggling with yeah. I, I mean I, I like the idea uh, and I like the idea that you're not calling it a landscape plan which sounds more like uh, lawn <laughs> I think we could like specify that it's you know it's a planting plan for the buffer area and any additional upland areas that are sort of considered mitigation for the impact. Um, you know, so for example, like the Portsmouth High School where they're putting in the tennis courts right. and cutting down a lot of trees, they promised to plant X number of trees across the entire, you know, high school grounds. Um, so that's a case where like they would zoom out a little bit in their planting plan in order to mitigate for their impacts in the buffer. 
And I think we want to enable that, but maybe that's just be a little more clear. Well, I think one of the things that we don't want to talk about, though, is mitigating, because we don't want people to think that they can mm. do things in the buffer and then all they have to do is just put some plants in an area and that they'll be good, because we really don't want things happening in the buffer at all. But if they, if, you know, a plan comes up and they, like my own property, I want to put a, a, a garage up over a place that's already mm -hmm. uh, impacted, it's impervious. And so I'm going to plant, I'm going to rip up all the pavement, I'm going to plant right up to the edge of where the, the drainage is for the driveway. And so it's that kind of thing that we're looking for. And so, you know, we're, we're able to talk to the people when they're doing the plan because it really is individual. I don't think there's a blanket statement that we can say because every plan is so different, every piece of property is different. Well, there's, there has to be discretion for sure. I, I'm just thinking, um, so it would be the areas that would be impacted, but then any areas that are proposed to enhance function of the yes. property? Yep. Yes. Yep. Would that cover it? And before you progress, I, I, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to go back because I did have a question about the effective date of this ordinance, which is mentioned under permitted uses, the previous page. So it's 10.1016, and it's the number four. Um, and it's talking about additions and extensions to one or two family dwellings that existed prior to the effective date of this ordinance. And I, is it January 1st, 1970? Or what is the effective date? Of, I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, the wetland ordinance started in 1995. I also saw that that date was there. OK. Um, it's later in the document. So, Rick, you're suggesting we put provide a planting plan detailing species and proposed location to enhance buffer functions? I think a plan of proposed locations of the impact and areas proposed to enhance function on the property. Okay. This, this com I'm, I've got some comments about the later sections about how these applications by what measure they are evaluated for approval. I think this ties into that. Anything else on that before, before we get to the next red line? All right. The next one is on the next page, and it's sort of just a statement and suggestion for applicants based on wildlife and habitat protection. So it's section 10.1017.27, and it states, where feasible, the application shall include wildlife corridors and habitat protection measures, including, but not limited to, curb cuts, slant edge curbing, amphibian tunnels, and space under fences to permit wildlife passage and the use of bird-friendly windows. Yes, Beth. I'm a little stupid. What's a bird-friendly window? It's a window that either has a decal in it or it's a special type of glass so that the birds see it and they know that it's glass and they don't run into it. So we're allowing our buildings to get higher and we do have, you know, birds migrating. And so to stop that from happening, it would be great if developers looked at using either decals or some sort of glass that is visible to birds. It's just pretty uh, minor, but it's just something that caught my eye because of, um, when you say slant edge curbing, do you mean sloped curbing? Yes. Um, it's just in the business, it's often called sloped. So it might be a term you may want to think about using instead of slant edge. And should this just be required or just should it be where feasible? Because if who's, who's determining where it's feasible? At this point, it's usually the developer that determines whether it's feasible or not, <laughs> which is, you know, not to our liking, but I mean. Because the, the other way to do it is to require it, but then provide relief if there are certain conditions 
that are demonstrated. So. Okay. So would you suggest a change in wording? Well, I'm just. The application shall it's include. It's too easy. It's too easy. I'm going to put a developer's hat on. Yep. Say it's not feasible. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. We we hear that a lot with uh, porous pavers or perme permeable surfaces that can't do it there. Water table's too high. Whatever. Um, so cut out where it's feasible and just put the application shall include. Well, I'm, you know, I'm curious. I bet the board has lots of thoughts about this one. Uh, Beth and then Jim, I think, do you have your hand up? To, to deal with the where feasible section, I say yes, take that out, but maybe the application shall include as necessary. And then that way, if it's found to be a necessity, it's not just because it's feasible. And then I think it gives us a little bit more teeth, but maybe legal might not think that. <laughs> You could say in the discretion of the board, mm. you know, depending on the application, the board may require. I could do that as well. I just think it's better than where feasible. Mm. Cause we that. can't require bird friendly windows if they don't conform with HTC. Well, it's the glass. Well, it's, it's in, just the, glass. in the historic it's district. Just glass alone. Yeah. It's the glass. And alone. the barrier to it is cost. Yeah. That's and it's cost. And then only pertains to the HTC district. You need your Marvin character. Greg, Greg had his hand up. Well, if we take out the where feasible, I don't know how you're going to have a gate for this thing. I don't know how you're going to have a gate for this thing. But I also think it's, you know, anybody's going to find this an overreaching financial burden. You know, having a custom made window to meet HTC requirements by Vermont window that has bird proof glass is going to take that $800 window and make it $1,200. The next thing is is not really taking into account the boom in household pets over COVID. The last three years, pets have probably tripled. And if you want to raise the fence that somebody put in to protect Fluffy from a Fisher cat, you just killed Fluffy. <laughs> you, you put a fence to the ground to keep out wildlife from your household pets. And if you're approved to have that fence in your backyard, and a fisher cat runs under the fence, which that's where they live, and they eat the dog. I, you know, I don't think it adequately takes into account the full scope of residents and the boom in household pets over the last three years. As a landlord, I rarely get an application that doesn't have a pet, which is kind of a problem. And I've been a landlord for 30 years, and it's not been this way forever. Well, I think that you also have the issue of um, a lot of people that have their emotional support critters that are probably in their backyard and they want to protect them from the other critters on the other side of the fence. So having a fence six inches above the ground doesn't solve the problem. Well, I think that's where what Councillor Moreau said would help us with this in that, I, I'm not quite sure how you phrased it. it well, it either could be to the discretion of the board, as the chairman said, or we could say that it's as necessary, right? So <laughs> if the necessity is to keep wild animal out of the yard, then you don't do it right but if you're you know a wildlife corridor then it might it, be a small it kind area. of takes all the teeth out of the audience i i really do like the idea of not impacting or cutting across a wildlife corridor you know like deer paths and stuff like that i think you're on the right track i, I really do but i just think it kind of went 45 degrees off of the intent well, I think that if we put in uh, Councillor Moreau's wording, that that would give the board the leeway to make a judgment call. And the thing is that there are a lot of developments that have gone in that are in areas where there's a lot of wildlife. And we would rather not have them section off everybody's yard because this is these are wildlife corridors that they're building in. And so what can we do as, as a um, conservation commission to help protect that? That's what we're looking to do. So if you have any other suggestions, and there, there are, I can you know, rattle off a few of them actually in my head, where people are building in what were wildlife corridors and how damaging fences can be. What was Councillor Moreau's wording? I said as necessary. You added at board discretion. It could I go did. either way. I, I think the key is to provide some flexibility because when you say shall, that's mandatory. 
correct, Councilor? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. I mean, one way to address it maybe is to break it out into different sections. Um, then you can have or to bullet it. I think just giving the list of things and then as necessary, as necessary or as necessary required by the board, both those things. Go ahead, Trevor. If I may, is there, if the intent is to protect wildlife corridors, is there some objective way to determine if there is a wildlife corridor present that is necessary well, to protect? I mean, how do you determine that? When we look at, at, that? The, um, at the properties, generally you can see animal scat, things like that. You can, you can see where there's a corridor that's not man-made that like deer have been traversing through for a long time. We've had um, uh, West Environmental provided us with uh, a pool of study, a uh, um, public undeveloped land study, which told us that there were wildlife corridors in certain areas. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we could tell that. But when you have a large area of over 40 acres in the city of Portsmouth that's forested, there's wildlife using that area. And they're using it as a corridor to get from point A to point B, wherever there else there's not disturbed land. And so now we have developments in those areas. So we just are trying to um, keep Portsmouth friendly, wildlife friendly as possible. So backing up and following up on Trevor's question, should they have should the application requirements include identification of wildlife corridors or significant wildlife corridors or? It sounds like it's well documented enough. Fish and Game have any <coughs> help with that? Yeah, there's definitely <coughs> maps of like priority wildlife corridors. I'm not sure it would pick up on these maybe smaller, yeah. you know, animal I mean, trails yeah. that you find, but maybe the Pula study is the thing that we could point to. But that's public undeveloped land. There is private land. Yeah, that right. it's, it's a tough, tough, be a tough requirement to put on everyone. The problem with a lot of these, like a lot of projects need it, a lot of projects don't need it. I guess that's the trick is splitting that up. So there's not a map that somebody could refer to to, I mean, I know from just going out on woodland areas, you can see where the deer have been going through and things like that. But um, a regional movement like a regional game trail that's the kind of thing I think you're thinking of right well in addition to amphibians using the area the upland area to get out of the wetland and to, to breed or lay their eggs so I mean, there's a lot of that too where sort of where the fencing came in with the turtles and there's been a lot of work statewide on doing wildlife like Lynn was referring to but at the individual homeowner or, or develop, you know, commercial development scale, it might be tough to find that data for each property. But I mean, there could be an instance where you require it or something like that, I don't know. So this is where we, we can't really differentiate between um, someone that's putting in a development of 50 houses and somebody that's, you know, putting a garage up in their backyard, but there obviously is a difference. And so it's the people that are putting in 50 homes or whatever that we need to have look at this thing. And so rather than specifying that the individual homeowner should do this, if they have a large enough piece of property, maybe they should, but um, we're, we're trying to I do it the best way we can and I don't know how else to approach it. I have a suggestion. I mean, in our other ordinances, we define the size of the parcel. And so when you look at a half an acre lot, this would be a problem. But if you look at a 40 acre development, just like she mentioned, which, and then, you know, and I know where those 50 houses are, and yeah, that's in the woods, um, that might have been a good requirement. I'm with you on that. But the way it's written, it it goes down to this level where I think your intent is really at this level and at this level it could work but at this level it's going to cause trouble I think that's um, can you give me a chair um, we have some things that apply on on uh, like our zoning large parcels we have definitions of large parcels and where other triggers come in if well, there's, there's differences between single family residential development, multifamily residential development, commercial development, and you know, the tiers of proposal get different levels of review. Um, I'm with you on the idea and with the commission on the idea of this. I wonder if, 
if for now we should go through the other some of the other comments and come back to this one and you know think about maybe how we massage this a little bit just as a suggestion yep. I think there'll be some more as we yep. as we go like the next one that says we're feasible yeah. <laughs> that is the next one yeah. right below that one about um, so where feasible light and noise pollution should be reduced includes temporary construction noises such as from blasting or the rock hammer that's been behind me for the last two months <laughs> sorry um, any comments on this one yes Greg I believe the city already has uh, restrictions for hours of when you can rock hammer and blast I mean there was a development right next to my own home and they were restricted to the hours and the days that they could do everything it's exactly seven yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so I this is overly broad if they want to restrict it different than what the current building r rules are um, we have to quantify it well, this wording, what you can say, this is more of a goal. It's yeah. like uh, it's to be encouraged. <clears throat> light and noise, reduction of noise and light pollution are to be encouraged as a design measure. You could say that. Okay. And Anything else before Kate moves on? So on the next page, section 10.1017.46, um, it's an additional criteria for how the application will be assessed for approval. And it states other property constraints such as setbacks, view corridors, utility easements, etc., are not justification for needing to site a project or portion of a project within the wetland buffer. Sure. Yes. Sorry. Um, I think this could be the most contentious change in the ordinance. I see applicants really pushing the limits on this new requirement. So I'd only suggest that legal review this carefully and make sure it's as airtight as possible, if that's the right terminology. Once we have something for them, once we've said it's good to go. Yes, Council Rock. I guess my issue is the wording of this. What is the overall intent? Because needing to cite a project is not in me. In my mind, I'm not, it doesn't mean I think what you think you're meaning. Well, what happens is that people need to build in the buffer because there's sight lines or there are other things that they need to take into consideration with their. Um, project and to us you need to make your project smaller if you yes. want to be able to fit your project on this piece of property and so we're telling them that you I know you have these other constraints put that all into a ball of wax and you can't do what you're intending to do on this piece of property and that's what we're trying to get across the hospital addition being the most recent of this Basically. They had a utility easement concern as well as setbacks concern all along their man-made weapon. And, you know, with the hospital, it's like throw up your hands. I mean, it never should have been built where it is in the first place, but that's right, right now. <clears throat> but at any rate, it, this is what we're looking for. We're, we want to tell them right up front that don't come to us and tell us that you, you have to build in the wetland because you have a, a site cor a view corridor or whatever it is. Not to say that we can't consider it, but the thing is that it's really not. It so shouldn't be part of our consideration. Right. So really you want to, I just think it needs to be rewarded to the point of that these items, and I'm trying to do this off the cuff, these items are not justification for building uh, actual structure because these are all going to be some, they're building something, right? So I'm thinking for structural improvements or structure. Well, they're maybe not to or create an impact in the buffer. Yeah, right? encroachment. 
encroachment of buffer. Yeah, something like that. I just think that there's an easier way to word this so it would just come out being a little bit clearer so that any lay person that reads it is going to understand what you're looking for. Well, we would have to take out et cetera. That, that's not a good word to have yeah. on. Um, <laughs> or, yeah, or like items or well, something like that. Well, does anyone know other things that would... Yeah, what are we missing? Yeah, what has come list? before you that has... Setbacks, view quarters, utility easements. Yeah. I support the utility easements and the setbacks, but I think view corridor is covered under the economic condition, you know, economic considerations. In other words, a view corridor is, is something that you establish to raise the value of your property and the uh, make it more valuable, make it more preferable. And oh, I understand why we're not going to allow somebody to build something in a setback just so that they can see something. <laughs> Right. So this what board, this board we're wouldn't. saying here is that because you have to maintain a view corridor doesn't mean that you can encroach on the wetland to do so. You can maintain the view corridor and you can make your building a little smaller so that you're not encroaching on the on the wetland buffer. That's I agree with you. I just think it could be worded better. Yes, that's oh, is, sure. is the intent let's say you're building something whether it's a house or an apartment building and there's a potential for a view out across a buffer that's got a forest on it and you don't want those trees to be cut is that that one of the things you don't want to have that, happen? that's part of it yes I'm just <laughs> I think the, the I, another project that came before us that's still kind of contentious is the one on the Richie lumber property and, and I feel like all three of these things were in play for that one including several view corridors from some of those streets um, and that was one where you know the the when discussing the project we can't you know we can't put it here we can't put it here we can't put it here because of setbacks view corridors utility easements and yet you know they we just wanted them to make it smaller so that they were encroaching less in the wetland we weren't saying that those you know you should go back and try to get um, you know concessions for those it was just make it smaller so that that's another project that this has come from for us we, we no, fully well, just the one, one quick quick thing we don't talk about specific applications especially one that's still pending okay. so, but I, I get your point points. I yeah. get your point completely <laughs> yeah yes Beth. I've done a quick rewrite property constraints such as setbacks view quarters easements do not justify wetland encroachments or wetland buffer encroachments I guess is really what we're talking about buffer. What, what do you think I like it is a view corridor quantifiable <laughs> well, well with the explanation we just had we've got some in our regulations there are easements sometimes yeah, that like are on Dover yeah. Street or uh, yeah. McDonough yeah, yeah mm -hmm. certainly setbacks and utility easements are quantifiable and have a boundary <laughs> hoping that view corridors also have a boundary therefore they would fall under a constrained umbrella I mean I'm, I'm guessing they do they were on plans well, you mentioned the view corridor that exists by our regulations. I was talking about one that I want to create yeah. because I want See, to. I, I don't, don't think that's create. what we were talking about. Yeah, no, but I think that that's but it could something be. we would like to include here. We would like to protect trees on the buffer, and so there's other language further on in this that talks about uh, trees that are greater than six inches at breast mm -hmm. uh, breast height. Um, DBA not allowed to be cut, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Should we use your language for now and maybe come back to this if we need to? We can. I, I took out the word utility not to take it out, but that it would include all easements because there might be other easements on property that would prevent someone from being able to build in an easement, like a right of way for someone to get to another property or whatnot. So I just think taking out other, because I just think others, never a good word. Um, property constraints such as setbacks, if you want view quarters, easements they do not justify wetland buffer encroachments i think is just the most straightforward way to 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 read it but that's just my opinion which leads language. us right into the next section which i have some big issues with <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. 
So the, the next few changes and additions are all in the criteria for approval section. So this first one is 10.1017.50, and it's number four. It's an addition. So um, it now reads, alteration of the natural vegetative state or managed woodland will occur only to the extent necessary to achieve construction goals. The square footage removed of natural vege vegetation or managed woodland will be replanted with similar or more diverse ground cover. Maintained lawn is not an acceptable ground cover. Shrub and or trees, as was existing within the same distance from the wetland, that vegetation was removed where possible. It's hmm, a lot of words. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> um, having built in Massachusetts on an island next to a pond, they have some really creative ways of dealing with what you're trying to say here. And one of those is instead of going down the line of saying maintain lawn is not acceptable ground cover, they allow you to put something that they call a meadow, but you're allowed to cut it X number of times a year, which is much, it's aesthetic, it solves a lot of your concerns, and it's a lot more palatable than kind of pigeonholing that. The way you, the way it currently is. That's that's my first one. The Thanks. Massachusetts meadow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try building in Edgar Town on a pond, <laughs> on the ocean. I have an issue with that, though. Anytime you mow a meadow, you, um, especially if you're doing it a couple times a season, you should not. Um, anyway, you're killing you're killing your ecosystem. You basically have a longer lawn. Um, you actually shouldn't be ever mowing a meadow uh, if you wanted to sustain it as um, an ecological um, entity. Um, so anyway, that my two cents there. So if, if you, you allow mow mowing of any- If you don't mow a meadow, it doesn't stay a meadow. It gets trees in it and it gets right. invasive species in it. So you if you don't mow, mow a meadow, you get saplings which become trees. It's no longer a meadow, it's Well, a you can take out the saplings individually and you can take out the shrubs. Not um, cost effectively. So. No. Then you define what size sapling you're gonna cut. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay so there's saying, a question yeah, about mean, mowing. There's a question about mowing and maybe changing lawn to meadow. Um, what else? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Square footage equal? Is that is that even? It might not be feasible in every case. So, I guess I have a problem with putting. Yeah. Well, the thing is that that only necessary to achieve construction goals is so broad that we wanted to put some sort of limit on it. Good intent. <clears throat> because they may decide that they need to take down every tree on the property, which is obviously happening, uh, in order to achieve their construction goals. Isn't that a site plan consideration? And is there, a, I got a question on that. Yes, it is in part of site plan. Is there other regulations above the city that, re, that, for example, you can't cut trees in a shoreland setback, you know, particular, you know, I, my experience is in Maine. You just can't touch anything. There's, Unless it's dying, or you have a letter different, from an arbor. There's different distances. <laughs> yeah, there's different distances, and there is protection for trees in a shoreland, a state shoreland buffer, not quite as extreme as no cutting, but you have to balance it. <clears throat> and, and that's that would apply in a <clears throat> in a uh, tidal buffer. Okay. But in a freshwater buffer, that wouldn't necessarily. It wouldn't apply. apply. Okay. Not okay. from a not from a shoreland perspective. Okay. Unless Thanks. it's a really big pond, <clears throat> we don't okay. have any of those. Okay. <laughs> So the intent, I think, and keep in mind, and this is one of my concerns, and this came up at the meeting we had last June, as you remember with the Municipal Association. This list, if you look at the very first language under 10, 10, 17, 5, 0, the Planning Board has to find that the proposal complies with all of them. It's a shall comply. It's not discretionary, which is something I have mentioned several times to this board and I want to bring up again tonight. Um, so we need to be, if it's, a, if it's part of a shall comply list, there's no discretion. So if we want to have some discretion, we need to word it differently or put it in a different place. Well, another thing that I think we have a problem with is we can, it's over intensification 
of a piece of property that there's um, there's an allowed use but it's pushed to what we consider to be an unreasonable limit and there's really no nothing that we can stand on that tells us that we can fall back on and say hey no that's outside the the reasonable limits for the project that you're suggesting and so that's where it comes into play that it we just say that this is too large for the property but we don't have anything to back us up you know what i mean mm -hmm. i do know what you mean um my my issue my big issue with this these criteria even before the edits they apply to the entire city of portsmouth and if you look at the entire city of portsmouth things vary dramatically we have areas and you've seen applications where we've seen properties that are horribly impacted by dirty past uses that need to get cleaned up and that is often used as a rationale for impacts to the wetlands buffer and other things a cleaning up a really dirty site is a good thing in my world and putting that on the back of a developer is an even better thing I think that that helps and I know applications have been approved with that understanding that's not what this says should it say that you know I think there should we should treat the forested project let's say the 40 acre site that you mentioned earlier that has some wetlands it has maybe it has a vernal pool in the corner it's got some really interesting things and it's got a, might have a wildlife corridor going through it that it should be treated differently probably than something that used to be a dry cleaning establishment you know or something like that which we know aren't isn't one of the cleaner uses historically um, it's a bigger it's a bigger reach bigger lift heavier lift if you will um, if there's idea that people would like to talk about that I would be happy to work with Trevor to come up with something to address that because I think I've seen it with um, some of my clients property I don't do applications in Portsmouth but I have done boundary work in Portsmouth and the other thing that sometimes happens is buffers coming behind buildings that are already existing so you may have say the North Mill Pond with a condominium project but the hundred foot buffer comes six feet behind that building should that be treated the same way as open you know the entire hundred feet being open probably not I don't think um, it's more complicated yeah so that's how it's so discretionary it's very um, that's not the way this is worded though are so, you talking about number four specifically or are you <coughs> saying the entire criteria for approval all of 1010 1750 are shells in to do things properly according to this ordinance you have to the board has to make findings that are in concert with all of these and the pre preceding thing that we just talked about are those those are the possible conditions and other criteria by which to judge them so the bigger question in my mind is should we be should this ordinance should the section of the ordinance address the different conditions because as as an engineer and somebody who writes regulations it has troubled me to see applications that have merit and they're doing a good thing but they don't conform to this ordinance that that's a bad fit in my mind and they, it should be allowed we had one just recently and I I mentioned it to the planning board as we were talking about it and I won't mention it again because it's an application are we allowed to speak with past approved applications as they relate to this if it's been long enough that it is not on appeal and sure it's under construction okay. Sagamore um, you know there was a wetland on the other side of the street and the site was within a hundred feet but there was a road in the middle <laughs> and if you tried to apply some of these restrictions in the buffer which is on the other side of the road which is where the stuff's being built it's a good project uh, to your point and the wetlands on the other side of the street and you really wouldn't be helping on this side <laughs> well in that case water flowed underneath the road to get to that wetland area so, you know so there is a, a water connection through that culvert that went under the road I mean you could argue that there's 
but the standing wetland was on the other side. <laughs> and that, that's yeah. one of the developments that has taken down every single tree. And there were very sizable trees on that piece of property. It looks devastated yeah. when we go by it. And the thing is that if there was a way that we could have at least protected some trees. It looks devastated, the but, but they also got rid of all the dead cars and all the garbage that was there for the last 50 years. <clears throat> well, I, yes, Beth. If we're going to change the criteria for approval in any way significant that has been suggested here, I think that we need to put that any proposed development other than installation of utilities within a right of way shall comply with as many um, criteria as possible. I think we need to change that so that it does give us that flexibility because it's starting to get to the point that you know, all, every single one of these things would not even be possible on some of the projects that we've seen. Well, is, it, yeah, that, that would be one way, that, that's one way to do it. The other one, I, I have suggested previously, you could add a criteria that provided nevertheless, if the planning board finds significant environmental uh, enhancement by virtue of the nature of the project, then it can waive all or any of the above. That would give the discretion that we, the board has actually been using I don't know if it's too broad. You know, it's good. I think it's good to have direction for applicants and not have it completely, especially where it's a conditional use permit. Where this 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 goes, the only avenue for appeal is court, or if it's housing project, housing appeals board. So it's. Well, since you talked about the fact that developed property and undeveloped property mm -hmm. are two different things, maybe we have we state that somewhere. Well, that's what I was saying. I mean, it, it wouldn't be too hard to rewrite this section pretty quickly. I mean, I I would volunteer to do that and then give it to Trevor for review. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, we I, I've actually been talking uh, over the past couple of days with with Peter about you know these these edits. I think Legal has some different thoughts on how this might. I have some different thoughts about how this might be restructured as well. I read your memo uh, that you wrote a couple years ago about this section of the ordinance. I think we have some thoughts about how this might be restructured in such a way that it's clear, more clear to uh, applicants, people in the city of Portsmouth, and, and provides more um, um, understandable, you know, pe people can understand what to expect, I guess, when they're, when they're applying and how to work through it. I think we have some thoughts, and we'd be happy to work through it and you know, take in all, synthesize all the thoughts that have been, that will be and have been espoused here today. So given that, yeah. and since you've been a part of that conversation, would it make yeah. sense to take this particular 10, 1750 section and convene a separate discussion and come back? Because we ought to have uh, more joint meetings. We really should. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that would be fine. I guess my concern is that trying to, divide up the city into areas that could have impact and areas that couldn't have impact or divide up a wetland, you know, kind of score a wetland and decide it, ha it can have impact or it can't have impact. I think part of the benefit of having that discretion is that you can treat each project on its merits that's in front of you instead of putting it into a box in advance, which, you know, over time we know how quickly wetlands change, that might not apply and if we don't keep that updated, that Grading system. I'm completely with you on that discretion and not trying to. I'm not talking about a score sheet. Yeah. No, that would be wrong. Okay. So, uh, I think I think I think we're on the same page. Yeah. So. Well, I, I just have to say that I was around when we wrote the uh, wetland ordinance, and it has changed over time, but minimally. Um, we received a lot of pushback on having an ordinance at all, and. Um, you know, we were shooting for 125 feet of protection and uh, other uh, opposition was suggesting maybe 75 and we, you know, compromised on 100. And I'm just, I just want something that we're going to be able to get past the, the council and that's actually going to do what we want, which is to protect the environment as much mm -hmm. as possible. So if you think that you know, the three of you could get together and put something that's better than this in front of us, fine. But it just, I just have to tell you how hard it was to just even get this by anybody. I can appreciate that because this is a conversation I've been having for years myself, so I understand. But I'm, I'm encouraged by the possibility. So 
do you want to explain the, the other three, I think it is, sections, or should we bundle the whole thing? If you looked at, do your comments include what they've already proposed, do you think? Um, it, they do. I, I would also, uh, you know, I guess what I'd be, some of the items that legal is, uh, has comments on, um, you know, I already know that, but what I, what I guess I'm here, what I really want more is to understand and hear the thoughts of the board, okay. of the board and the commission and understand where you, you all want to go with, with this. So I okay. think it'd be valuable to yeah. keep working through everything. Let's go, let's go line by line then and sure. please explain as, as they go. Just Jane, one question. Um, it, just inside the same bullet, um, I just really appreciate, you know, even if you reword it, um, I appreciate the theme here about, you know, trying to um, like replace trees that were existing so that we don't just get, you know, a completely leveled terrain everywhere, especially with developments. This is for proposed developments. And so maybe we should think of, you know, some minimal size of a tree that needs to be replaced you know, of a certain diameter that needs to be replaced. I, I feel like we are always just pulling teeth to try to get developers particularly to provide any kind of trees that aren't literally spindles that will grow in the, they won't be mature trees, you know, for the next 60 years. And I don't think that's what we want. So when I see that in here about the trees, I, I, I just think we need to make it more measurable. And I see that there's a chart later on, which I also actually really like. Um, but there okay. needs to be some wording in there about that being a shell. Just a couple of comments on that, and that is that the larger tr the tree you put in, the harder it is for that tree to adapt to the new site. And so I think that's why they go after the two and a half to three inch caliper trees, because those are much more adaptable. The problem is, though, that we are really losing a lot of trees in the city of Portsmouth. And, and is there some way we can stop it from happening? Okay, Kate. Okay. I'll jump to the next one, which is also in um, criteria for approval. It's number seven now. Um, and I'll just state for this that um, we do have a bullet already about wetland boundary markers, which is in section 10.1018.40, which is a few pages after this, um, that's already in the ordinance. So for this um, criteria for approval, it's stating wetland boundary markers will be, permit will be permanently placed on site to mark the wetland and wetland buffers as appropriate and assist in educating the community on sensitive wetlands. Wetland boundary markers are available, available for purchase through the City of Portsmouth Planning and Sustainability Department. That's a requirement. I mean, we just, across the board. It's under a list of uh, criteria that the board is supposed to find before approval, so I think it may be, it already exists somewhere else. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. I think it's in the wrong section. Yeah, I think it is too. I, I, I think it needs to be, just needs to be moved. And, and what we what we say in the section of the ordinance where we do list it is that the the applicant because you know someone might have a wetland buffer 30 feet from their house or someone might have a wetland buffer in their living room so it doesn't always make sense to put it at the edge of the buffer so we asked in the when we did it before we asked they show it on the plan that they submitted so then the boards have a chance to review it and decide if there's enough if they're in the right location and so um, I can't remember why we added this one in addition. I think it was just because we always we required them, and so that was a condition of the approval. We just I, wanted to add it. Yeah. yeah. I think we also wanted to sort of um, advertise the fact that we want applicants to purchase our boundary markers, that we want to sort of have a um, similar look Consistent. across the city so that they're recognizable. Um, so we put in a little section advertising that they should be at least approved by the planning department or that you should purchase them directly from the planning department. So it should just say city markers are required. Yeah, yep. and maybe we put it to the application requirement section rather than yeah. a criteria for approval. Good place for it. I think, I think the next one goes in that area, that section as well. How did, did the commission talk about the permanent nature? Because wetlands boundaries do change. Yeah, mm -hmm. permanent might be a, the wrong Thanks word. A 
without major human intervention. I think when we said, I think when they said permanently placed, it meant like a not just a little plastic steak. Yeah, that's I, I get the idea. Maybe we can have a better word for that. Instead of permanent, just. The mowing of the meadows, they say every three or four years. Um, okay. And that keeps us going. So, sorry, guys. No, I was just giving just some very perspective embarrassed at from my someplace mistake. else. No problem. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. So, are we going to think about moving that to application requirements? Is that? Yeah, I think so. That's. Okay. All right. Then, if there's nothing else, I will jump to the next one which is um, another criteria for approval on the next page, number eight, and that is just based on NOFA standards, so um, requiring Northeast Organic Farmers Association standards for organic land care, and those will be followed. And that also should move. Yes, Andrew. Um, more of a material comment, but figured it's a good time to bring it up. Um, from my experience on the Conservation Commission, as well as from proposals that we've seen, uh, there are certainly a healthy component that are just your one-off homeowner, property owner that are we're doing some work and they have to come before the, the board and, and ask for some sort of relief. I do feel as though it's a great opportunity to educate property owners and create some sort of distribution material that goes into maybe descriptions of NOFA standards or why we looked at the Conservation Commission website. <laughs> no. There. Okay, we have all kinds of literature there, including the NOFA standards. Yeah, but like, so I guess the enabling factor is like them coming to the board and saying, I don't know what this means. You know, I, I'm happy to abide by it, but I don't really know what I'm abiding by. Um, so it's a good opportunity to like allow them to leave with something like a nice little goodie bag of like information and say, hey, thanks for being a good steward of your land. Here's all this stuff that we'll need to maintain it. Um, and it's not only for conservation efforts, but also just FYI, the city of Portsmouth is doing some of these eco municipality um, practices and we'd really appreciate and encourage you to follow the same. Uh, welcome to Portsmouth. So you're talking about a goodie bag for when people buy property in Portsmouth? I mean, sure, if you want to go that route, but nonetheless, <laughs> when they come before the Conservation Commission and they hear all of these terms in this vernacular can be confusing to a lot of people, particularly people that may not even be making their own proposals, they have an engineer or an attorney do it, the, the parting gift for them would be all of these educating materials to then say, hey, whether it's you that is running this property or a tenant or a condo owner or a future owner, right? It's just, it's good to have on hand, and it's now printed in paper in their hand saying, like, here it is, right here, you can't miss it. Yeah, but you see, I think that rather than having it printed in their hands, that they can just go to the website and- Nobody will do it. They can look at the information. Nobody will yeah. do it. I agree. Uh, Maybe you need it. to present it to them differently. Save the paper, use the website, but it comes out with, you know, their tax bill or, <laughs> or something, you know, when they go to apply, it's an online thing well, we, that we directs do them have, there. We do send out, um, in fact, I think we were looking at doing it again. Um, need to do it again. The yeah, little blue water. We have a, a uh, brochure that talks about anybody that's got a wetland buffer in their house, mm -hmm. anybody that's on wetlands. We send out a little flyer that says, this, these are the things that you need to pay attention to. And it has descriptions as well as images on there that show you what it is that we're, we're talking about. So people that have wetlands do have that that comes in the mail to them. Um, yeah, I just don't like having more paper, that's all. I sure. find that if you could we'll use their phones and go to a QR code. Push that to social media. <laughs> I mean. I think we could, make a, we could give a reference to the Conservation Commission website, but, um, and I know we've, we've had conditions where we've said to use these standards for fertilization. Um, how broad, I, just show my ignorance, how broad are the NOFA standards? Uh, and by incorporating another document by reference, what are we bringing into the city's zoning? Well, the thing is that it, what, it we also sort of clarify uh, in another section the fact that um, low nitrogen, low phosphate fertilizers are the only things that can be used and no pesticides or herbicides in the 
uh, wetland buffer are allowed. So we, we specify that. But we would like people to go further because they have lawns that are not in the wetland buffer. And so that if they can follow these standards, uh, it would be better for the environment overall. So we can't stipulate that somebody with a lawn in the, in the front of their house that's not in the wetland buffer follow these standards, but we would just recommend them to them. So, I mean. Yeah, I think the no standards sort of give them more information about how to meet those requirements of the, about fertilizer and pesticides. So I get the question is, are they encouraged or required? And then mm -hmm. do they do they treat a half acre site differently than a hundred acre site? Because they're farmer standards. So I assume they contemplate large parcels as well. They do. Is it? If, a, if they, a developer, they're, if a developer, they're just applied to whatever piece of property you have. It's very easy to just translate it. But is it? Are, are they? I'm just. My, this is my ignorance. Are they equally applicable to a half acre site downtown as they are to? Yes. I mean, it okay. depends on what the half acre site is like, but yes. Yeah, it's talking about landscaping practices. As a requirement or as an encouragement? Yeah. So how do you enforce it as a requirement? Is our, was our problem? Well, if you incorporate a document by reference, is is there a doc, is there a single NOFA? There is a doc, doc. There is a document that has this title, and it's available on their website, and it's subject to change, obviously, because anything subject to change. But they have but it. It needs to guide. say it, so it needs to give a date or as may be amended or if if just from the legal perspective, it, it, if you're going to make it a requirement, um, you should. You should really uh, reference a specific document because it's an issue of notice. You know, how are people going to know what document it is that they have to follow? You know, think about the building code, the food code, things like that. It's a specific version of the code that is that is adopted. If you're going to make it a requirement, um, if it's if it's just encouraged, that's 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 different. Right. But if it's a requirement, you have to put people on notice what it is that they will have to um, comply with. But for environmental things, we're finding more and more, I mean, the information has been very bad in our country over all the toxins and things like that. And so the NOFA includes, I believe, it includes environmentally safe things. Now, sometimes we find things aren't safe. So the, it has to be sort of something that moves and keeps up with current information as opposed to, you know, setting rules about something that, you know, in five years we find out, no, that was really not the wrong, um, or that was not the right ratio of whatever to, you know, whatever, you know, pesticide to square foot or, you know, not pesticide, but, you know, whatever, um, the lawn, you know, nitrogen or whatever. I don't know. Sorry. Um, but is there something, is there a way in which it can, because the, NOFA updates their information. If you tie it to their information, can you can you keep a a fluidity that that keeps up with? Well, I, again, it's I you know we're we're you know I understand those concerns and yeah, they're definitely okay. <laughs> really good concerns, but we're up against like constitutional concerns as well and and notice okay. of what people will have to comply with. You know, I mean, the same could be said about the food code. The food code is, is, is cha that changes all the time. The building code changes all the time. We're constantly finding safer ways to build things, safer mm -hmm. ways to handle food. And um, we do amend the ordinance uh, from time to time to update, uh, okay. you know, the building code, the electric code, yep. the, the food code as the international standards change. Okay. Um, so so I, if this were to be a requirement, I would, I would recommend, again, choosing a static document and then but it, you know, it's, the, if it, it's the act that we would have to amend it again okay. as the NOFA standards change. Okay. And that's not a big deal, sort of? I mean, it's not a huge hurdle? It would be what we would have to so, do, yeah. Okay. So is there only one NOFA standard for organic land care document? I think I think this is the title that it we... Is the, I was yeah. going to say that's literally the, the title. title of the document. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it has is, a subtitle. It was published in 2017, yeah, and it's listed edition. specifically when you go there. Yeah. Okay. So maybe putting it in quotes just to make it clear that it's a specific document. Yeah, it should probably have a date reference, and and would you not recommend having as may be amended from time to time, or 
I would not. I would not recommend that. I would recommend doing an, passing another ordinance change if you wanted if to adopt changes. a. I mean, you could theoretically, you could conceive. You know, we don't know what that organization does. You could conceive of changes <coughs> that this conservation commission, this planning board, the city council may not agree with. So. so the actual specific date and document is on the conservation commission website. Uh, the actual uh, the link I to think it. The document or a link to the document. I is think there. it's a link. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Which can change too. So I, I think it's a good point about the location in the ordinance. Yeah, and it has to move. We have standard stipulations in our TAC approvals. We don't really have a set here. We could create this as one, or we could try to find another place in the ordinance. We can, we can look at that. It should probably move to the same place as markers. It's the same the idea. The application it's requirements? It's a requirement. Yeah, I agree. We've got a gentleman down there. I'm sorry, Bill. Excuse me, is this throughout the city or is this in the wetlands? Wherever there are wetlands and wetlands buffers. But but that's there has been some discussion about moving it, having something throughout the city. If that was the case, it would wouldn't be in the wetland ordinance, it would be in a city ordinance. But that's a different conversation, I think. <laughs> Maybe I misunderstood. What did you mean for trees and things or this is wetlands. This this yeah. is a wetland section, but right. what was your question? How did you mean the question? This provision only relates to within the wetlands. Yes. But if we make it an ordinance, it could become citywide, right? That would be different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, at some point on things like this, is there a, a cost assessment of what it might mean? <coughs> no. To the property, owner, property owners, you mean? Well, there's an overall e economic impact. One, the cost of Sorry. enforcing it as a city, and it's also, mm -hmm. you know, overall economic impact is a bigger word. A bigger well, thing. And, and where where economic considerations are not sufficient reasons, um, you know, they're basically excluded. We have to, we should be careful about that if I, something. Well, I think that was with specific application to the applicant. I think the question was more about the economic impact to the city, to the city in enforcing this, creating oh. it, and how much it's going to cost to make it happen, I think would be the right. generic word. Well, if the, if the applicant has to put up markers that are provided by the city and are pretty permanent, and it's gone through the process of providing all the information, I don't think there's that much the city has to do that it's not already doing, right? So are those markers sold to the applicant, or are we giving them to them? We're selling them. To them. We sell them to them. That's sort of kind of, I think, yeah. where this whole thing's going, is if the cost is piece. borne by the applicant in some way. Yeah. Not on the taxpayers. <laughs> I think we're back to you, Kate. Next one is a few um, wording changes in section 10.1017.831. Um, I'll just go through the whole. It's a kind of big paragraph, but you'll see where the red lines are. Where it can changed. I just can I just jump in on this because I think this is important to give a little background on this. This section falls within a section 10 10.17.80, which is the wetland protection plan, and the wetland protection plan is for projects of more than five acres with a, with more than five residential structures. It only There's only one in Portsmouth that has this wetland protection plan in place. It's Hillcrest Estates because that's how they operate there to make it so that every time they bring in a new mobile home, they don't have to come in for wetland conditioning use permit. We came up with an uh, ordinance section that other, other, you know, mobile home parks or places where this type of housing is, isn't contemplated would have a more of a comprehensive approach to looking at the wetlands on their site. And so when you think about this section, this is for the individual site plans they do at that park, but it's not like an individual wetland permit application. So it's just for one site um, at a mobile home park in this case. Sorry, Kate, go ahead. That's a great explanation, thanks. Um, so I'll go through the whole thing. Uh, the major change here is that we've added that no blasting is required. Um, so 
to start no net increase in impervious surface within the wetland buffer. Building structures or other impervious surfaces may be constructed, expanded, or relocated within the wetland buffer, provided, provided that no blasting is required. No new impervious surface shall be within 50 feet of the wetland boundary. And any new area converted to impervious surface shall be compensated for at a one-to-one -one ratio by the conversion of existing impervious surface within the wetland buffer to vegetated open space, which we change to just planted areas instead of lawn or planted areas. Such compensatory open space does, does need to be shown on the approved wetland protection plan and shall be shown on the permit, si permit site plan submitted with the building permit application. So a few wording changes there. Yes, Beth. <clears throat> so I just want to make sure I'm understanding, because you've changed this 50 to 100 feet and then 25 to 50 feet in yeah, several that's, places. That's coming. We're going to talk about that in more well, detail. Was, it's the start of this section has that in it. Yeah, that's why. right. No, I know. <laughs> so I guess I, I th guess I really need to know what the rationale is um, about changing those the, the foot, because I know there's going to be a lot of pushback from residents about this, especially at the council level. So. I think we need to make sure that we really have our ducks in a row as far as the reasoning behind why putting more strain on homeowners in the buffer is important. That's why I'm asking this question about well, that. It, it might be worth going to the next slide then because it, it goes into detail on what you're referring to, the, the changes that are in the vegetation management section. Do you want to? Skip this I, then for now. I, the hill I think so. I, I, well, I think there was it's up to just, the chair. I think we we skipped over one. I think on right under the requirements. Requirements. That's where I was. Yeah. Submission requirements one. Eight two one. Eight two one. The fifty. I've got it. Mine says fifty dash one hundred, without a. The fifty isn't stricken. As I guess that was supposed to be stricken and changed to a hundred. Mm. That's what I was trying oh. to figure out. Yeah, it's <laughs> I got between stuck. 50 and 100 feet. No, yeah. Between, yep, that's where the new buffer would be. The area between 50 and 100. So it is between the what? limited cut area. So right now, is it it's the limited cut area is how is it now? 50 feet, right? Just so now you're doing the whole hundred. The, the limited cut area goes out, extends out to 100 feet now. Well, no, to currently it's it's for between 50 and 75 feet from the edge of the wetland, and the change is to go from 50 to 100 feet so it adds 25 feet so the, it expands to the full the full width of the buffer from 50 feet instead of just to 75 feet of the buffer where's the limited cut area is it Start, to, is starts that? at 50 feet currently and goes to 75 feet so so there should have been a 75 oh and I'm looking at yeah, the there's no pool. 75 in there now I'm looking at the vernal pool sorry <laughs> the inland the in an inland wetland it's it's <laughs> it's 50 to 1 it's 50 to well is it 25 right now it's 25 to 50 so if you look at the table and in section 10 1018.20 it spells it all out I think we're back on um, we're at the beginning of the wetland protection yeah I was going back under 10 10 10 17 82 1 it should be the it's same, the same, it it's the same, same standard it's and it's not, spelled out in the table mistake. but that would be a mistake yeah, yeah. it's just I'm checking so it's, it's, it's just a typo uh, just okay I'm just trying to understand yeah, so it Limited cut. That's the bottom of yeah, page nine. Fifty feet. Uh, so where it's, it was this is where I am. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking at the table. So it was twenty five to fifty and now it's fifty to a hundred. Yeah. So we're just missing a range right there. Fifty to hundred. Fifty yeah. to hundred is, is what we what you're proposing. Is the proposed, proposing yeah. changing it to. And it was twenty five to fifty. Is currently 25 to 50. I understand the thought. Is there science behind the numbers? The more area that you have, the more protective you can be of the wetland, and the more you have as a planted area, it's that much more protective of the wetland. And there is science behind that. Is there been, has there been a problem? I'm just doing the little devil advocate here. Has there been a problem with the existing dimensions? The problem is that we have um, people cutting down trees mm -hmm. in the buffer that um, we would like to protect, 
and so that's why we, we moved it out to this point because right now the limited cut area went right up to 25 feet which meant that you could cut anything out of there and we're trying to come up with some way to protect more area I mean we have nothing to say about upland areas the upland areas can be deforested because we have nothing in our power to uh, you know negotiate that but but this will allow us to at least um, you know have a little more power about cutting trees down even if they're only in the buffer so, scientifically they say 250 feet so this is the compromise that that you know we're making I mean if you Many communities have not for decades, but they're finding that 250 is a recommended wetland buffer. Is that where the state got its shoreline protection so, dimension? Because that's 250. The, sh the shoreline protection dimension is 250, but within that, the shoreline buffer, I think, is 150. So, yeah, there, and, then there's a and then within that, there's the cells, and yeah, it gets really complicated. <laughs> well, just so everybody understands, we're not talking about we're, the, the vegetated buffer strip, is what we call it right now, and it's the so you have the edge of the wetland, the wetland itself, and the, from the edge of the wetland to 25 feet into the upland next to the wetland, right now is the vegetated buffer strip that we're change, we want to change to no cut vegetated buffer strip, which basically means you can't cut anything in there except invasive species, as Allison mentioned. And that's for 50 feet, and then the next 50 feet. That's for 25 right now. But the proposal is to move that to 50 feet. So there'd be no cutting within the first 50 feet of upland next to a, a inland wetland, a tidal wetland. Um, vernal pools are different. We won't go into that right now. And then instead of starting at 25 feet, you're starting at 50 feet with a limited cut area. And a limited cut area then will extend to 100 feet. And what that requirement is, you can't cut more than 50% of the trees greater than 6 inches DBH. So you can cut all the vegetation except for the trees greater than 6 inches DBH. And you can only cut, what, I think half of those. So it still allows you to cut some trees, allows you to control the vegetation from 50 to 100, whereas before it was um, from 25 to 75. And then from 75 to 100, there was no controls on vegetation. So you could basically cut all the trees. On the, right now, you can cut all the trees in the first 25 feet going towards the wetland, and then half the trees the next 25 feet and then nothing, 25 to zero, so. I think I understand the changes better now. <laughs> yeah, it's basically just extending the vegetated cut, the, the no cut area 25 feet further out, and then the limited cut area 25 feet further up, or 50 feet further out, I guess, yeah. The explanation you just gave, Peter, where's that written? It's, it's in the table on 1018.20, yep and vegetation management. So it's the performance standards for wetlands. Mm. Wetland conditional use permit. And the explanation you had about cutting half and all that, where, where's that? Number three. Um, That's number three. 23-3. Oh, and I think we changed it to any tree. Is that what you changed it to? Right. Any so we, tree versus we removed half more the than trees. 50%, which we used to have, not half, and now it's, it's any it's, tree. It's, not, it's half now, but it's proposed to be all, so protecting all the trees. Uh, that are larger than six of, inches. Yeah, of the certain... Uh, Later six, than six inch six inch diameter. Three inch. But three talks about the buffer, but aren't you recognizing the, the distinction between the no cut and the vegetated? You, the way you described it is different in my head. The way the way this is worded. It, the no cut is is in eighteen point two two. Um. Oh no, there's a definition actually, we don't have section article 15. 
which has the definition of the vegetated buffer, but it's basically you have to leave all the vegetation shall remain. In the, right now, in the first 25 feet, all vegetation shall remain in that vegetated buffer strip. And then the limited cut area is where you're allowed to cut some of the trees. In this case, the sum of the trees are the trees smaller than, in the change, right now it's, it's half the trees greater than six inches can be cut. The change is only the trees less than six inches can be cut in a limited cut area. If they're six inches or bigger, they're all supposed to remain. You have to keep them. Which in a way is there so it's a, it's a location and a, and a number. So would it, so does the vegetated buffer now become the no cut? So we just call it the no cut? That's just to, to yeah, it's the same. So first, the same. first you have the no cut, then you've got the limited cut. Yes. Correct. And the buffer straddles both. All of yes. it, yep. Yep. That's right. This is definitely more objective, too, I would say. It's like it's very clear, right? The 50% rule is very fuzzy, right? You're a new property owner, you can then cut 50%, and then property changes hands, you can cut another 50% of the tree. You know, like there's um, where's the starting point is confusing, um, whereas this is, I think, pretty direct. Yeah, it'd be harder enforcement, too. Yeah. So it's really the way you described it, plus in addition, larger trees, you don't touch them in the buffer the way this is written. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Go ahead. I guess it's a follow on to the other question, but are these numbers derived from other ordinances in our geographic area or in the vicinity or or, and are currently in use in either other cities or states in the neighboring area, or are they arbitrary? Because for the, to follow on what Beth said, to get city council to sign off on this, you're going to have to come up with some more justification than you made these numbers up. Because their biggest battle, and everybody is running on it right now, is housing. And this, we are intimately familiar with the buildable land in the city of Portsmouth. It's been hashed over for the last two years. And this would take that long determined number and do a lot of damage to it. W would it though? I mean, yeah. are you considering some areas in the buffer zone to be buildable currently? No. no. I mean, this but isn't, just this isn't changing the 100 foot buffer that's considered unbuildable. But it's adding infinite number of criteria that are going to change approvable conditional use permits in the buffer zone. So I think it will reduce buildable lots. That's my comment. I mean. But we're only looking at what's in the wetland. Okay, we're yeah. not talking about, and, and what's in the wetland buffer is not buildable. So there, okay, that's not correct. We have approved numerous things in the last two years that were existing things in the wetlands buffer that made no sense, and they came to us and they created additional housing and cleaned up the buffer. This is clarify. really just to clarify that the section we're talking about is a is a vegetation management section. So it's how the buffer is managed. It's not, so the board still has the ability to approve a conditional use permit to cut down the entire forest all the way up to the edge of the wetland and into the wetland if they so choose. So it doesn't take away your discretion to approve a conditional use permit. It says within that buffer, you are only allowed to cut, you know, you're not allowed to cut any of the big trees in that buffer once you control that buffer. So it's, I, you know, your your point is the, your point is what well, reason for the change. If if we have well, the, the discretion to change it on an application, then why do we have to change the numbers? So this is changing the way the vegetation's management. So the way people manage their buffer on their property, with the goal of trying to protect more trees. I guess that's the bottom line. Um, also, like Massachusetts has a hundred foot setback for buffer. Um, 
and they're a lot more strict about letting things get built or people messing with the buffer, I, I believe. At least there was when I was down there. And Kittery has a six-inch um, tree policy, cannot cut any tree in all of Kittery, whether it's in a buffer or not. Um, uh, so for you asked for neighborhood okay. things. But Those are two cool. that I know of offhand. Good answer. Yep. <laughs> yep. Rye, so. Rye won't allow you to use machinery to cut in certain areas near the buffer. Yep. Yeah, okay. can only be hand. Yeah, it's very restrictive. There is actually a really nice analysis of, of the buffer width that every municipality enforces in the whole watershed. I mean, so you could have that in hand, I guess, when you're talking to the council, just to see how Portsmouth compares. There's a there's a good number that have a hundred foot buffer, and then there's you know obviously a portion that have no buffer. <laughs> I think to Greg's point, it's going to be dependent on the conversation we had earlier about the earlier criteria, because if if the board has the discretion that it's been exercising and 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 the conservation commission has been recommending applications that in my opinion didn't conform with some of those criteria so again i think we've been looking at things that provide overall environmental benefit as a good thing and so if the regulation is in conformance with that then everybody should be happy and allow more housing so Any other? We sort of jumped around a little bit on yeah, sorry. cuts and no cuts. And <laughs> would it make sense to change and just use a simpler language? Have the no cut and limited cut? I mean, just change the name altogether. Yeah. No cut and limited cut. Sure, I, I think so. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, originally it was just vegetated. It's too vague. And then we added no cut. And so if you say no cut, it yeah. kind of makes it clear to me what what I can't, can't do. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a just a question? Is there a reason why the why no cut or well, now why vegetated buffer strip is a defined term but limited cut area is not a defined term? Is there a is there a historical reason behind that or is if there is I can't remember what it is. I thought actually it was defined in Article 15. What the limited cut area is it uh, not? I, I think just no cut. I mean vegetated buffer strip. I think I'd have, I don't it was have left it. Out so you could find it. Do you have it? No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> mm. but so it Limit, should, it should be so. defined. Yeah. Yeah. We need a definition. Limited cut should be defined. And I think when the time comes, we can provide you know some references for the signs behind that. Just make that offer. They're certainly out there. Are we up to snow or? <laughs> uh, not yet. I think we got to go just down to the fertilizer section where we added in um, that the use of fertilizer, use of fertilizers other than low phosphate and slow release nitrogen fertilizers, added in in compliance with NOFA standards, is prohibited in any part of wetland buffer. Um, and then we can get into snow standards. But I don't know if we want to hash over NOFA standards in this section. Sort of just cites them again here in this section. Yeah, I think we're up to snow. Wouldn't it be simpler just to say fertilizer shall comply with NOFA standards? Yes. Yeah, that would be clean. Snow. All right, next page, and I believe this is the last one from the Conservation Commission. It's on snow requirements, um, section 10.1018.50. So an application with parking lots and or roadways must designate and mark with signage in the field snow storage areas outside of the 50-foot wetland buffer. If snow storage areas outside of the buffer, if snow storage areas are outside of the buffer, and uh, oh, I don't it's think it's worded correctly. <laughs> Yep. Are, not <laughs> are not possible, comma. Yeah, Perfect. It's a typo. <laughs> then they must be transported up. Um, additionally, a winter maintenance plan must be submitted and work must be performed. Must. Another, another typo. Uh oh. Must be performed by Green Snow Pro certified companies. 
could you tell us about what Green Snow Pro is? Because we have been holding up the no salt thing mm -hmm. so, in, in our recent approvals, but what is Green Snow Pro? So Green Snow Pro is a program that is run through, um, I think, UNH T, T squared technology transfer originally. Um, I don't know where it is at now, but it's um, overseen by uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, and they basically created the program so that different people that do snow winter maintenance activities would be trained and then they would learn how to use less salt and still get the same results that you know make an area safe without using so much salt and then they also need to track how much salt that they use as part of the certification and they take ongoing training so there are other cities, Man Merrimack has um, this in their regulations too, and there's other cities that do in, in towns. And it was set up with enabling legislation and has been tested through the legal system. And the first sentence, just to be clear, parking lots or roadways, so it's not driveways. Correct. <clears throat> we did that on purpose. So that's what I'm thinking, because you couldn't get Joe with a snowblower and a pickup truck trained. That was my thinking. Okay. okay. Well, and be I nice guess... too. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, that, that would be difficult. I guess when you put in roadways, but you're talking about private roadways. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't... Maybe private legal. parking lots and roadways. What about pickleball courts? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I wonder if is there is there any other companies out there? Or should it have or equivalent, or is that not something it that's done? It used to have equivalent, but um, everybody else has taken it out. So hmm. other communities, yeah. Oh. And and the equivalent was because they were Green Snow Pro was new, but I think it would be something we'd change if Green Snow Pro went away. More. I guess my other question would be. Private parking lots do, I mean, what if it's a parking lot for a two unit building, it's three or four spots? Like, is there a size that would trigger this need? Because you might find a small business owner with a small, you know, or work, stay at home work that is required to have three or four parking spots under our parking regulations might find this onerous. So that's why I'm just, to be the devil's advocate, you know, should there be a certain size of lot in order Area. to trigger this? That would be a question. <laughs> I don't remember if we discussed I don't it. Think we discussed a size in particular. No, I think we just wanted to not have it be onerous on the residential somebody's residential. Yeah. driveway, right? Is parking lot a defined term yet? <laughs> well, I no, I'm serious. I, I mean, well, I'm sure you are. But <laughs> I think so. Back to parking. I just think if you have you know a three-unit building and you park four cars behind it in a residential, it would be hard for them to come up with somebody that would be able to do this. That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Is it just really small? Are, how many green pro green snow pro people are there? Are there There's lots? A lot. I don't know how many are on the spreadsheet now. I can find out. But, but it, it's so it's not like the two guys who say, I'll give <laughs> yeah. you this one and I'll do it over here. That's no. monopoly. Okay. Now there's a spreadsheet and it's listed on, and there's hundreds, you know, in, in different communities even. So there's okay. a lot of people. I, I can find out. The community might actually want to require it of anybody that does plowing in the area. Yeah. What if it's just I'm thinking outside the box what if it's on the tenants who live in that building because it's only a three year building with four or five parking spots to actually remove the snow themselves they won't <laughs> <laughs> saying if it's part of their lease and they're but they're not going to know about this standard right no. so I He's guess right. That's, they won't <laughs> right. so do you want to put it like I mean should we put like half an acre or an acre I don't know I, I don't know I, I'm just I you know you could put a size of the parking lot. You could put a number of units in the building. You could put an amount of parking spaces. You spaces. could put, right. I just Let's think you should. Why don't we just think, put that put for some consideration? Thought into what really true size. Peter, Peter along that line, um, this is for new applicants, right? Not existing conditions. 
this right so that was one thing that i was thinking about was we're in the conditional use permit section and this sounds like it applies citywide but it's really just for a, a proposal that's before the board to review that is a conditional and, use permit. you know i've lived full cycle from when the city said they would never approve another pud ours was the last one 25 years ago and now, now you're approving them again and that's exactly what this applies to is because it's private road yep. quote unquote but as i live in a PUD with nine houses in it and we just use a company that's got three guys and he's a very organic kind of guy and he's never he be mentioned this kind of thing he might be certified so, yeah, i would be, be surprised if he wasn't i'd be surprised he didn't offer it to us already and hmm. i mean we've been using them for 20 years so i'm just concerned about this as being restrictive for a guy like me that hires plow guys well, the thing is that there have been a couple of developments that have gone, that have gone in that we have specified that they use green snow plow. Okay. Uh, snow pro, and okay. they they agree. So it's not a problem. Like Piscataqua Landscaping, that's a big company. They're green snow, and they actually teach some of the classes. Oh, cool, because so. that's who plows my parking lot at my office. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, thank you. So when we, when we reconvene, then, you guys can bring back some additional thought about this, and we'll talk about the other section that we talked about earlier. Oh, is it? Is there anything else that we had to? I think we covered several of the other ones. Did we get everything? I mean, from our end, I think so. The one we wanted to go back to. Hmm? Except the one we wanted to go back to. Oh, yeah. From the beginning? That's what I was, that's why I was asking the question. That's section 10.1017.27. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, we can look at we can look at other options for that one too. I mean, what always other communities have done it. Get that. <clears throat> yeah, it might feed into the other the criteria too, but um, that may be a. And since you're cross pollinating both groups, you can open form. Yep. Yeah, I just I. The city of Dover just up, or, uh, is updating their wetland ordinance, and I just received it today, so I haven't had a chance to go through it. But looking at other communities might be beneficial. Any other comments? Thank you guys for starting oh, this. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I just have a few generic comments. If On the zoning ordinance in general, if we were going to make these changes, would it be possible to include page numbers? on the whole zoning ordinance because I think the ordinance itself is two or three hundred pages and it's very hard to reference a particular thing because there's no page numbers so I don't know if that was a big ask or if there's a reason why they don't have numbers now if it's but if you've got it electronically you can just search the PDF for that section number and it'll bring you right to it true I just don't know why it can't be on the paper version too I think the I think the issue is that when you update a section of the ordinance, repaginating the entire document is much more complicated than just adding a new section in. So, it's that that's the basic. You know, it's it's more about not printing, having to reprint huge huge, you know, and repat because you have to repaginate the whole thing every time you add a section. But one, you know, there is a solution to that, which we're already we're getting to, is we're going to have a online ordinance, a different way to manage the ordinance, and it probably will have page numbers. Similar to one. Dover or Rochester's? Exactly. The E360, e yep. yep. I think it's called. Or Great. one of, maybe not necessarily them, but one of those types of ordinance. They're one of the contenders. There are for several. Sure. All right, yep. super. Yep. Uh, my next comment is, um, you know, the CONCOM does very important work, and we read what you folks give us, because we have to approve, you know, many of the uh, wetlands ordinances and when we get a package for a meeting you know it can be a thousand pages long so what I think would help at least me would, would be if the CONCOM vote on a particular issue was in the in our packet instead of just the CONCOM approved it would be helpful if it, we knew if it was a 7-0 vote or 4-3 or 3-4 so I didn't know if that could be another change we could make so do you want uh, like comments as to why somebody didn't 
approve something? Would that uh, be useful? Yeah, that'd be great. I, I would just start with what your vote was, and it would it would key us, at least me, into looking at the issue more carefully. A 4-3 vote's a lot different than a 7-0. Gives us context. I mean, we, we do that. Does it just not get into their packet? It's, uh, it's usually I, in the memo. I thought it was in the yeah. memo. It's usually I think it's in the memo is whether or not it was unanimous or whether or not it was split. In our, in, the in our comments. But I, I rarely, I, I think it's usually approved or not approved. I don't think there's a vote number in the in the planning board packet. I know I've seen unanimous, but I, I don't know that I've seen split votes. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I assume you guys don't always vote unanimously. Correct. Correct. <laughs> oh, there's been several things that have come to us that have been split votes. So, yeah, I've seen them in there many times. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just simple things. Just whatever you, the CONCOM vote is to the planning board, I think would be really helpful. Sure. Concerns. That's super helpful to hear, actually. Yeah. I, I've actually always kind of wondered Almost what that serious. communication looks like between yeah. the boards, like what, what you actually see. I mean, yeah. obviously you see the, we usually include some stipulations with our approval. Yeah. And it's then do you see like like all of the minutes from the discussion? Mm -mm. I don't think no. the minutes is that would no. be too much. But yeah, yeah, of it, course. <laughs> we really do look at it. Like, what uh -huh. were they thinking before exactly. it came to us? And then what were they thinking before it came to us? And how did they get to this conclusion? Are we missing something? Yeah, do you see the stipulations? Yes. We see the stipulations. Yes. stipulations yes. Are yes. Yeah. They're carried into the memo, yeah. He wasn't exaggerating. Sometimes the packages are like council packages. I believe they're, you. Yeah. They're, yeah. You know, they're Ours gigantic. Are too, but <laughs> we get them. We can get long ones too, yeah. I think we have asked to see the whole works. So we probably get something very similar to what you get. And we, <laughs> we have to go over with a magnifying lens. Yes. Yeah. You got to dig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scrolling through 240 pages. Exactly. <laughs> I think that is another thing that I know Dover has been looking at too is providing they're calling it like findings of fact like just a little bit more justification or rationale behind the recommendation that goes to the planning board I mean, it might be just another it's required thing now by required. statute yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that we could help generate that for you right I mean I assume that would be helpful mm -hmm. yeah. think about what that looks like so we'll send a poll out for another sure. meeting to get together to <laughs> finalize or advance this hopefully mm -hmm. finalize it mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I feel like two of well, In terms of timing make, on getting, oh, sorry. sorry Lynn, no. I was just going to make one offer. You know, obviously, this, these, these, this, these guidelines are very restricted, right, to just the, the wetland buffer area. But if there are any concepts in here that you feel like should be elevated and, and instituted citywide, I think that's something that we would be fully supportive of, you know, whether it's the snow pro or the fertilizers or sort of a tree ordinance, you know, things that could, we could take these ideas and zoom them out. If, if folks wanted to, we would help you. Well, one other thing I'll add, we did formally start the master plan update process recently, which has only been that. That's all we've done. Um, but Conservation Commission input on that is going to be very valuable and desired. desired. So awesome. think about it. Great. Thank you. Peter, you I was just going to ask in terms of timing, you know, um, how, you know, we're going to work on some things here internally. So I guess. I'm not look. I'm just hoping we don't. We have a little bit of time. Yeah, it might be. Not, not next month. week. Yeah, no. For the holidays. Or next month. Yeah, yeah maybe tomorrow. For the holidays. <laughs> this year. As soon as we can figure it out, but yeah. Okay. No, it's not the only. Uh, not the only thing happening on the third floor. No. <coughs> However, I do get sick to my stomach when I see some of the applications come in front of us. I feel your pain. Excuse me? I feel your pain. <laughs> we sometimes ask, what were you thinking when they bring them to us, too? <laughs> Anything else? Are we? Okay, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.